you heard earlier in the we the women global town hall a journalist from khabar leheria talking about how the first time she touched a computer people in her village told her that women were not meant to touch computers later you heard another young girl talk about how when she touches a mobile phone in her village if it's a smartphone girls and their homes are fined 25000 rupees that in some ways brings home the kind of gap when it comes to men women technology technology and stem now the figures actually tell their own story unesco tells us that women form less than a third of global stem workers 43% of women graduate in stem subjects but only 14% end up being employed as researchers the numbers are rising and we see only the headline stories but there's still a long long battle ahead and to talk a little bit about her journey Let's place in the spotlight now our next guest today. Let's welcome Reshan Shahi, who's the technology lead at Mersk, one of our uh, principal partners here at We the Women. And uh, welcome, Reshan. And again, we're running a bit late, so I'm apologizing to everybody because I know how valuable and your time is and how busy all of you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you decide to get into the world of tech? and 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 when you did how old were you i think it's a uh, firstly thank you uh, barkha for uh, for doing this town hall and of course uh, feel privileged to be invited here today um i think uh, the the reason i i say that it's a privilege is a lot of our stories need to be heard and to be told so the perception and this what you just talked about right why are there so few women in in technology a lot of it is got to do with our is not having enough role models out there for us to look up to um to to really uh, inspire the next generation of uh, women into uh, into areas like technology but let me talk a little bit about my uh, background and uh, how i got in there yeah so i come from a small town called indore which is in central india it has the um, best food i have to say it has the best food and the cleanest city so they have a lot yes, going there yes that's true that's true um and i have been raised by a single mother so um you know a lot of uh, my growing up years uh, were uh, were in indore uh, with my mom um and uh, you know and at that time technology was also something which was evolving so i wouldn't say it's it's the same today i think we know and use a lot more technology yeah. today than when we did back then um but the important thing was uh, at the time the one thing that my mother always made me believe is to believe in myself and there are lots and lots of stories or there are lots and lots of uh, experiences that i have had during my childhood or my growing up years uh, which re really made me believe that i could do anything i wanted hmm. so happened that i um i uh, married my husband and i i got to california in the uh in the 90s um where uh, i had so much exposure to technology and so many so many people i could talk to and understand and be inspired from um that uh, you know technology seemed like the right thing for me and and the right profession uh, and the rest is history and do you think that if you hadn't gone to california that you know that exposure obviously changed your life and it triggered your passions but had you not do you ever wonder what if I do I do and I think um, you know I've thought about this a little bit but I sometimes um when I reflect I do believe that it takes a sanya nehwal to have a pv sindhu come up right there are uh, we all have to have people we look up to or we want to be like um and be inspired because I, I'll be honest I got married when I was 22 I didn't know what I'm doing with my life mm -hmm. so I really needed to be around with people uh who could help or at least uh, help me make up my mind and and give me that direction that maybe this is the right thing for me so i think a lot of us uh, even now and even in sports we see that right when you have the the indian cricket team the women's team playing up i'm sure you know methali methali raj will have a lot more uh, people who would want to become cricketers in the future so i think and this is yeah. not women only right this is every walk of life sure role models are everything but you know 
I remember at We The Women uh, last year when I actually remember it's so ironic that you were going to speak on technology and technology failed and we couldn't connect to you. But Kiran Shaw made this very interesting point about how there are a number of uh, women in India who graduate in STEM subjects, uh, you know, who are comfortable in the sort of science, math, engineering space, but it doesn't necessarily then translate to a job. And that that's where, in a way, the gap is. The gap is not necessarily in enrolling for the education dimension. Why do you think that gap is there? Uh, I think it's, a, again, a very interesting question. I, I do have my own theory on it. And let me uh, let me tell you what I think uh, mm. is happening mm. now and how it has been different in the past. Corporations work today for two things. One, they work for profits or they work for shareholders and you know outcomes and the billions of dollars that companies make. Two, they work for the betterment of the society. And that is a change that I have seen even in my uh, career. If I look back 20 years, right, we didn't talk about cruelty free products. We didn't talk about decarbonization. We didn't talk about recycling. These are concepts that now the corporates talk about a lot more than what they yeah. did in the past. So this social, um, you know, give back or the social thinking of for corporations is something that has that has built over in the last few years. And I do believe that is leading to a change to say, you know, having more diversity in the workforce, having more women, having more different kind of people, it's good for the society. There is a, there is a very strong understanding and uh, acknowledgement that it's of course very good for the business. There's lots of studies which tell you that, you know, having a diverse workforce will give you much better business outcomes, but it's also something that we as corporations feel, uh, almost liable. We, we need to do a lot more for the people around us. And I think that's where it's changing. You are seeing more, not just women uh, in, in terms of diversity, but, you know, having people from all walks, colors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to participate and, and be a part of the corporate setup. You know, uh, just before you, we were interviewing uh, uh, sort of the women of the Shark Tank uh, uh, India edition, and they were all talking about their journeys of entrepreneurship. And they spoke about how difficult they'd found it to access capital. Earlier in the day, we had women from rural India talking about the resistance to women accessing computers, smartphones. I want to ask you in your own journey, what are some of the obstacles you faced? And what are some of the obstacles that women you know have faced? And how can companies you know, forward looking companies, progressive companies make that different and make it easier for more women to rise up the tech ladder in particular. Uh, I think again, um, if I look back 20 years back and I'll talk a little bit from my personal experience, right? Yeah. I, have, I have two children um, and uh, I shouldn't call them children because uh, they are 22 and 18 now. So they are a little I mean, bit for you, they, for you, for you, they're children, right? Yeah. Yes, they are. So, you know, when I was, uh, I was in the early parts of my career, I was also having my kids at the same time. And there were so many days where it felt so difficult and it felt so challenging being in office, coming home, you know, helping with the kids. Um, simple things like having a daycare facility close to your office. I mean, it seems like a very small thing, but it wasn't there. So it was just, you know, you had to figure it out all by yourself. I see that has changed over the last couple of decades, right? There's a lot more awareness. There is a lot more desire for um, workplaces to help women than what it has been in the past. Um, I'll talk about three things like, for example, what MERS does, right? We believe yeah. we need to recruit women, but we also believe we need to have a retention plan for women. We need to figure out how we will keep them in the workforce. Because your question of as you grow up on the ladder, you start seeing that you know it starts to fall apart. And even though you had so many people come into the workforce, you don't have so many people continuing in the workforce. So we have to have a retention plan. We also need to have special support systems or understand what the needs of uh, the gender are. Because for a lot of time, that has been ignored. So the things I talked about, for example, a daycare, it seems like a very small thing. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a life changing thing for a woman who has a young kid. You know, she's yeah. battling with uh, every day. 
You know, I always say, and I'm so glad you brought this up, that we talk so much about equality at work that we forget to talk about equality at home. And actually, the female labor force participation numbers show us that not more but less women are working in India. And after the pandemic, so many women may not even come back uh, to work. A lot of corporates are actually reporting that. So what you're talking about is really important. But let's start, uh, you know, uh, at school. The fact is that routinely when the exam results comes, we now see girls often outperform boys when it comes to STEM subjects. But when it comes to attitudes, there's still an assumption that certain subjects are for boys and that girls are made for softer subjects and tech isn't considered soft. Did you have to go through that journey for yourself as a kid, as, as a younger person? You know, I, I, I definitely want to talk about uh, one uh, one story which has a very special place in my mind and I think it will mm -hmm. answer a lot of things that we will talk about. Uh, yeah. You know, this was when I was younger and uh, we used to stay in an apartment building where um, uh, where we had the elevator was invariably not working. Uh, and me and my mother used to stay uh, in here and, and one day it so happened that, uh, you know, there were some uh, heavy things we were going to take back home and the elevator wasn't working. And uh, we had great neighbors, but one of them, one of them did make a comment saying, oh, if you had a boy, it would be so much easier. You know, he could help you carry all this stuff upstairs. Mm. The funny thing is out of uh, this incident is my, my mother actually bought a watermelon for the next 30 days every day. And the only thing I had to do was to carry that watermelon. What? <laughs> this is so, an unbelievable story. Wow. Then? And you can you can ask my mother and I asked her why she did that and you know I think it it was such a small thing in life but it made me believe at the 30th day I was running with it you know I, I it didn't matter to me and it made me believe that it's it's a question that I need to find answers to myself if I want to do something there is always a way and there are, there are always choices to make. But when your um, mother made you do that, were you angry with her or did, were you angry with her then and appreciate her later for toughening you up? Like how did that play out emotionally for you carrying that watermelon up and down the steps? I was actually very confused. I had no clue why <laughs> she was doing that. Yeah. And I don't think, so I asked her, you know, I said, what, what's the point of, of this exercise? She said, no, I think I don't like people making that comment casually. Yeah. That was yeah. her response. On the 30th day, on the first day, I struggled to carry it upstairs and it felt like, oh my God, why am I doing this? You know, it's like my mother has some problems she's going through. I don't know. Clearly, she's, uh, she's not thinking this through. But the 30th day, it felt like, oh, you know, it's just one of those things that I do. So, uh, it, it, I mean, funnily, it makes you start believing that you can do anything you want to, but somebody has to give you that hope and belief that you can do it. And I think that it's no different for women in technology. Today, I do know there are lots of strong women and men I work with. I mean, it's just not about women. There are, yeah. I have had fantastic men in my life, um, starting with my husband, which this will be a surprise for him, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> well, we should be nice about them sometimes, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yes. No, but you make a good point about, you know, every woman who has come on this platform today has spoken about needing that support system, needing that encouragement, not having to fight dual battles at the workspace and at home. Final question to you, Reshim, if you had to go and encourage more young girls uh, into technology, into STEM, uh, and look at technology actually as a liberator, as an instrument of freedom, as an instrument of equality, what would you say to them? I would tell them two things, right? I think whether it's technology or it's, you know, there are tougher professions than technology. I think the first thing they need to do is to have self-belief. That's the first and most important thing to do. And the second thing, which may be a little bit uh, uh, yeah, controversial, is you have to constantly prioritize and deprioritize. And that's mm -hmm. the, the many pleasures of being a woman is you have a, a nurturer role just because of the way nature has made you. So I cannot let go of my kids. That's just the way I am. But there are yeah. choices I have to make. Some days I have to you know, be on the kids side. Some days I have to be on the work side. And that's a conscious choice that one has to make. If we are clear, if we are ambitious, we want to do something, then I think we should be ready in our own heads to make those choices as we want to uh, rise and... Yeah. 
you know, just before we close, it's so interesting you should say that because I always say that I've never understood this work-life separation because often, and especially as women, you will have to take your work, your work will spill over into your home and your home will spill over into your work. And many women are juggling both because men are not necessarily juggling both. So that is something I think companies will have to be empathetic about. Yes. Yes, and we'll have to be kind to ourselves, right? Barakha, it's just not about me keep judging ourselves. Yes. I didn't do it. Yes. I mean, I, yes. I never cook at home and I don't feel bad about it. So I think I've grown up a little bit in that sense. Yes. I'm glad we've started shedding the superwoman uh, stereotype and that and really it's about being kind to yourself and celebrating everything that that one has achieved through through sheer hard work and 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 merit. So thank you uh, Reshim Shahi technology lead at Musk. It's been a pleasure having you in our spotlight today and we hope to have you back uh, very often as we keep uh, talking to more and more women. Thank you so much. Thank you Barkha. Thank you.